we have a system that I think sometimes isn't gracious for life's ups and downs. You know, you're sort of a medical emergency away from not being able to pay your rent or, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and this idea that it's okay for people to, to live comfortably. I, I try not to come in with too focused of a solution before I clearly define the problem and vet the problem, you know, with the people that are decision makers in the community. And as long as we ask yes and no questions, it's as if we are working hard and fast to polarize. And if we decide there is no nuance and there is no complexity, then we are feeding into that polarization every time we do that. Hello, Boulder and the wider world. This is the Sharing Boulder podcast. My name is Philip Bogren, and for episode 45, I spoke with Tina Marquis, who is a candidate running for city council. We met at the main branch of the Boulder Public Library and talked about a wide variety of subjects, including her work on the BVSD school board, homelessness, the introvert revolution, middle income housing, her leadership style, and climate change, among others. I admire Tina for her tireless work defending transgender students in our BVSD in Colorado schools and for her thoughtful, and careful approach to decision making. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Tina Marquis. We ain't throwing starfish here now, we're having a good party. Talking about structural change. We believe the land is sacred, even beneath that vacant parking lot. But the weeds are doing their best to express the need for something different. Gonna make some space. Find me a residential pedestrian district where I can gracefully grow older. Gonna spend my remaining years sharing Boulder. Tina, welcome to Sharing Boulder. Thank you so much for making time this morning. I wonder if you could just introduce yourself for a, a couple minutes. Sure. Uh, my name is Tina Marquis, and I'm running for Boulder City Council, um, along with some other great candidates. And uh, my involvement in the community goes back pretty far. Um, I started volunteering at my children's elementary school in our neighborhood probably about 15 years ago. And from there, I served on the District Accountability Committee, uh, which is a committee that's made up of parents from the 56 schools in Boulder. I got to understand some of the different issues across the district, which is uh, 500 square miles. Not everyone realizes how incredibly large our district is. And then I ran for school board. Um, so I ran... Uh, served eight years. In the last four years, I served as president, um, including during the pandemic, which isn't what everyone strives to be. I'm the pandemic president. It was tough. People got pretty angry at school boards across the country. And so for you to serve during that time, thank you for your service. That, yeah. was, that must have been not easy. Yeah. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the things that came out of the pandemic was just learning how do you deal with a crisis? And that is what we focused on. A lot of it first was framing the question. And the question for us was how do we get kids back in school in a way that is safe for kids and safe for teachers? That was our constant question. And one of the things we did that I would love to see us do as a city and a county when we think about some of what I consider to be humanitarian crises in Boulder is to um, focus on talking about issues, specifically homelessness and housing insecurity, um, much more frequently. So when we were dealing with the pandemic, we were meeting with people in the county and the city and the Boulder Chamber weekly and giving an update because it was a crisis. Our kids being out of school was a crisis and we had to make progress quickly, but we had to do it in, in a safe way. And there was no like kicking it down the field to next year. I mean, it was like every week, it's like you're working hard to do what you can now. Yes, and yeah. then we provided really, really frequent updates to the community. And, um, and we did joke a little bit, sometimes there'd be a meeting 
And we actually had really high ratings for the first time. You know, a thousand people were listening to a school board. <laughs> and, it was, and you're like, wow, I, I didn't know that could even happen. Um, but of course, every, every parent wanted to know how their kids could get back in school. And we had to communicate uh, with parents frequently, even if some parents were really upset with the decisions that were made. But um, for us, we uh, were just committed to keeping the communication frequent and clear um, during the crisis. Well, that is a powerful way of framing what it means to handle a crisis. Because we throw that word around a lot. We, we say we have a housing crisis. We say we have a homelessness crisis. We say we have a climate crisis, but we're not doing weekly uh, status reports to the community of, of what did we get done this week to like solve these in some respects, existential problems like the climate crisis is uh, we, we probably should not be ignoring that, even if we can't you know, meaningfully reduce world CO2 consumption, mm -hmm. we can meaningfully address uh, fire mitigation and, you know, this, this sort of thing. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So and I, I think there's a lot of value to finding consensus with other government agencies and leaders in your area. And for us. Um, from my perspective, homelessness is a county and, and even a metro regional crisis. Yeah. And it needs to, I think we do need to get buy-in and think about a joint resolution across that geography saying homelessness and housing insecurity is a crisis that we need to address. Wow. Um, that 500 square miles number you threw out, uh, that triggers for me, uh, I think, Nether Netherland is in the Boulder Valley School District. Is that yes. right? In Ward and Jamestown. And uh, I don't know. Uh, yes. Yeah. And then how far north? I mean, is Longmont part of it? No, no. It's, it's all part it of St. Vrain. It goes up to Gun Barrel. Gun Barrel, yeah. And, and then, then out part to of, a part of Broomfield. Part of Broomfield. A little okay. bit of Gilpin County. Right. Just a little bit. That's interesting because I, I always think of Boulder as being 25 square miles surrounded by about 70 square miles of open space. Mm -hmm. And so that's 95. So this is an area five times that size. That's, yes. that's amazing. So yeah, that's a lot of coordination to, to have people weighing in on this crisis that you're managing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, um, when I was president and they still do this, we made sure to meet with each of the city councils at least once a year to share what our concerns are. And not everyone is aware that there's a quarterly meeting between the um, chancellor of CU, the mayor of Boulder, the uh, Boulder County Commissioner, the president of the school board, the superintendent, the city manager. That's happening every quarter. Um, and I, I always like to bring that up because people sometimes say, well, does, does this person know that this is happening or why, you know, and that communication is happening. So uh, yeah. just, you know. Um, well, tell us about your campaign. How's your campaign going? Right. So campaigning for me is a unique challenge. I'm an introvert. Okay. And so I, uh, I, I'm probably not even comfortable right now. Okay. <laughs> um, but I'm better at one-on-one -on -one than in large groups. At least, at least we're not in the small room we uh, started exactly. off. <laughs> exactly. So I guess it's a nice, comfortable space here. Right. So, you know, we, you might be seeing on Instagram, many of the candidates are going to events. I personally am going to football games, which is sort of a, another <laughs> uncomfortable place that I haven't been before. But I am one of the many people who are completely fascinated with Coach Prime and, and excited for the CU Buffs. But, um, but it's hard. I'll go to an event and I'm, you know, I think the expectation is I interrupt a conversation, which I don't like to do. Mm. I don't like to interrupt people's time or thoughts. And that's not where I'm comfortable. So I was at a book reading on Thursday. Um, a friend of a friend launched a new book. And it's kind of a cool story about the resistance in the Netherlands. And then um, and I was talking about some of the challenges I had and was thankful someone introduced me to some of the women there. And she said, well, you know, there's an introvert revolution happening. And I said, wait, this is what I need to be a part of. I like of. the sound of that. Tell me more. Yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, cool. OK. And she said, well, introverts are really good at doing things like policy or thinking really deeply and having meaningful conversations and listening. Um, and I thought, well, maybe that is consistent with who I am. And a lot of people, when they say why they endorse me or why they want me to run, they just say, you're a really thoughtful person who's going to look at, you know, listen to a lot of different voices, spend a lot of time looking both at data, but listening to the community sentiment. Mm -hmm. And they think 
that's going to represent, she's going to represent me well. And it's very less of an ideological bent. Um, and I got a lot of, before even the slates and the endorsements, a lot of different types of people were supporting me for those reasons. And I think part of it is being an introvert. Um, and you, you know, if your expectation of a city council person is to make a lot of long statements, you won't be getting that from me. I did not do that on school board. Um, I tend to be, I, I communicate, cu communicate clearly, except right now. <laughs> no, you're doing um, great. <laughs> but um, you won't hear me just going on at length I try to keep things short. You know, I, I actually prefer shorter meetings, not to cut off Short, voice. Shorter podcast interviews, shorter perhaps. Podcast. I remember you, like just a moment ago, I, uh, we scheduled this room for 75 minutes. You were like, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like, but yeah, I mean, uh, I've had some gregarious, uh, loquacious, uh, long-winded people on this podcast. So I just thought, you know, hey, if we keep it under an hour, you know, that's, right. that's also fine. But um yeah. yeah. So, so that's sort of, so the campaign, I think it's going okay. I'm also having a, a search engine optimization problem that is, is okay. just destroying me right now, but I think I, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and then I really am enjoying meeting different people. So yeah. that's been great. We met, I met with some mobile homeowners um, and, you know, from a school board perspective, we're very aware of the different housing types in Boulder mm -hmm. and in a, in a very like, in language I, I don't like, but we, you know, measure the yield of students per housing type mm -hmm. across the district. So it was interesting sort of meeting people from the different housing types. And Yeah, yield has a kind of a loaded meaning there, but it's like, how do you come up with a word that communicates and doesn't have other meanings? Exactly. You know? yeah. So, so and it always was kind of cringy when our incredibly sure. talented demographer would say, "Now the yield is lower." And I'm like, "Oh, that doesn't feel right to me." <laughs> yeah, that's like, that's like uh, corn futures in Iowa. Or yeah, like exactly. Um, well, cool. Um, well, so you brought up uh, middle-income housing mm -hmm. earlier, and so uh, maybe I'll just ask you an open-ended question about middle-income housing and the concern that you have about. Uh, bringing, you know, making space in Boulder for families uh, mm -hmm. and the, you know, to, I don't know if the problem is declining enrollment or if that's a symptom, you know, is that a problem to be solved or is that a symptom that uh, suggests there's something kind of wrong in the balance of what we're doing here? Right. Um, and I, I think it, I think there are a lot of things to think about. So mm -hmm. declining enrollment isn't unique to Boulder, to the city yeah. of Boulder. I believe our uh, enrollment is declining a little faster especially in the elementary level. So, um, but you have seen declining enrollment also in Denver. Part of that's gentrification. So mm -hmm. some families have been pushed out as areas have been redeveloped. And, and I really appreciate Mike Johnston's focus on um, thinking about not doing that mm -hmm. more. So that isn't one of his goals. Um, and, I, um, and I actually, I really admire a lot of uh, Mike Johnston's plans around housing and um, keeping families in Denver. Um, but yes. Can you put a little more detail into that? Like what I, I'm not following his mayoral uh, efforts there. So, yeah. so maybe if you could just give, give a, a little summary. Yeah. Mind. So I uh, there uh, Mike Johnston. So I followed Mike Johnston for a long time. He was mostly active really in the education area okay. as a charter school advocate and um, and also tried to do some uh, pass attacks through Gary Venture. So he uh, is looking at different housing options, and one of them is renting to own. Mm -hmm. So just thinking about that interest in being an, a homeowner, um, the advantages of homeownership, including deductions. I'm a homeowner, and I think it is a, it's a good place to be. It doesn't mean people can't be renters. But mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, Boulder is now about 53% renters. And, of course, we're unique because we have the, the college students, mm -hmm. right? So that's sort of a different, you have to think about that. But... We just went over 50%, I think, this year. Um, and thinking about, are we offering people ownership options um, in a way that might be competitive with the surrounding areas? Now, can we compete with Decono or Brighton? No. Um, but do we need to think about, like Mike Johnson is, are there opportunities so that people can stay here if they choose to become an owner? Perhaps as they get older, they build a little bit of wealth. Um, yeah. So that's one way of him thinking about housing in a way that I think is creative. Um, but for for us, I think that what we see in the Boulder Valley School District is um, 
I think over half of the employees are no longer living in the district. And that's that 500 square mile district, let alone yeah. the city, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's just, a, and, it, and we've seen these housing imp- increases in Louisville and Superior, as I think everyone's aware. So, um, and of course, that has a ripple effect on Longmont, as you know, some of our workers might be moving to Longmont, which is making Longmont less affordable for people who've historically been in Longmont. Right. And just thinking about this housing as a regional issue. Um, I didn't support the land use bill, but I did appreciate the regional focus. Um, and just thinking about uh, of this as this, this region and something like 80% of the state lives in the, the, the uh, corridor, the urban mm-hmm. corridor. So um, I, I think that we need to think about this idea that our essential workers, this term that came up in COVID, which are teachers, our nurses, the people who provide medical care, our dental hygienists, um, what ex- and our police officers, what expectation do we have that some of them live in the city of Boulder? Um, is that important to us? Is that a value? Is it important to them? And um, one of the things I'm interested in doing on city council is we had an in-commuter survey you know, the, the number 60,000 people in commuting is thrown out a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, first of all, we have to understand, okay, so what is that going to be a climate focus? Is that one of the priorities for, you know, addressing the climate crisis? And then the second is starting to, to looking at the survey for people who are coming here five days a week. So a lot of people who were surveyed in 2016 are probably now coming here two days a week. Sure. And there might be, we need, we probably need to change the conversation a little bit on, who exactly wants to be here because they're here five days a week? And we might have to make some more specific prioritizations about we really want nurses here to yeah. live here because we have an aging population. They're going to require more medical services. Um, and we also want some teachers to be here. And, you know, our, our enrollment's declining, but it's not gone. <laughs> so yeah, right. there are lots of kids still here. And in fact, we're seeing some actually positive news in the secondary level. But um so I think just thinking about what are those opportunities, what are the housing types they're looking for, um, and what are the ownership models that we need to be competitive with. Um, I will never say we should build, the, you know, the two highest yields of housing for kids are single family homes and mobile homes. Um, but then second are duplex, triplex um, anything that has a patio or a small backyard, uh, something like that. So yeah. I think we can really expand that view. But then, but it's really understanding what do these people want? And, and, and the harder question is, is it something we need to do? Um, and that's something I think we should be talking about as a community. It occurs to me that you are not the first um, member of the District Accountability Committee to come on the podcast. Uh, oh. uh, a year or two ago, we had Ralph Frid. I, I assume, oh, yes. I right. You know Ralph. And, uh, he lives one, in Lafayette. Yeah. One of the one of the reasons I reached out to him is because at one of the um, accountability com- quarterly accountability committee meetings uh, to the to the board, uh, he had ra- he had had a slide about the possibility of repurposing school property for housing, mm-hmm. and I was curious if you have any appetite for that. If there's any possible, uh, if that if there's any. And, um, momentum behind that possibility or if that was just kind of a throw away, let's throw it on the board, see if it sticks kind of sure. idea. So I think this is a good place for me to talk about how I approach sure. a, a question. So I think the question would be, if we close schools, what do we do with properties? Mm-hmm. And I think the way to think about that, and, and as you know, the city of Boulder does have, um, and Carl Castillo will remind, Castillo will remind you of this all the time. Who will? Carl, the um, legislative person for the city. Okay, yeah. Uh, the city of Boulder for the school properties has, um, I think, the first right of refusal. Okay. So for the properties. So that's something he'll always, you know, when people get really excited. Sure, yeah. He'll, okay. he'll be like, you know, just so you remember. Yeah. Um, so my question. That was, sort of thing needs to be repeated often, I assume, because yes. people uh, want to forget that that might be the correct. The case. Yeah. Um, and, and the school district also has in its policy that they need to sell it um, for the highest utilization. And that might include just the highest price they can get. I see. So that's another thing. Is, and theoretically, yeah. that's in the best interest of the school district. Now, you can argue that there are lots of things that are in the best interest of the school district. Housing so, for their employees, for, housing, for example. Yeah. Or a teen mental health outpatient yeah. um, combined with an academic program. Certainly yeah. something in high need in the city of Boulder. 
So the way I would um, frame a question like that is first are, let's look at the options, you know, mm -hmm. and based on the property. So we have different types of properties. Some might lend themselves to housing. Some might lend themselves to a mental health center for teens. Um, some might lend themselves to temporary housing for someone who's experiencing homelessness. Um, it could be a lot of different things. And I think if I were on city council, and this is how I approach things at school board, I always ask, well, what are the options? And now let's talk about the financial piece to it. What will give us the most benefit? Um, I, I try not to come in with too focused of a solution before I clearly define the problem and vet the problem you know, with the people that are decision makers in the community. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important uh, framing of how your thought process, like I, I tend to like get excited about specific possibilities and work backwards from that, you know, and like my overarching goal is I want to live in a residential pedestrian district someday so I can, you know, age, right. in, age in place. And when I can't walk anymore, I want to be able to roll around my neighborhood, you know, and um, and so I kind of work backwards from that goal. I mean, not that not that that's that big of a contrast to what you just said, but um, that's a I do, pretty broad goal too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought that as I said it out loud, I realized it wasn't like a specific pro right. proposal on a specific property or something like that. But, um, anyways, yeah. thank you for sharing sharing that. Um, maybe do you do you mind giving an example of like uh, something like that? Yeah, that's happened on the school board. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've or, got or, one. Yeah. Look at that! I've got one right in my back pocket. Uh -huh. Um, I think it was when we talked about removing SROs from schools. Okay. And yeah. so removing SROs from schools might be one part. This came this this acronym came up on the podcast oh, okay. Uh, okay. recently. Um and security that's, resource yeah, officer. Security resource officer. Um SRO is more commonly used on this podcast as single room occupancy units. Fantastic. You know? so, okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> really good um, clarification. So um, the so we the school board had recognized we had an issue with disproportionate discipline um, mm -hmm. with kids of color. And and that's obviously something that most uh, school districts are trying to address. Yeah. And there are different ways of doing it. And our district, first of all, changed some of its policy to support that overall goal. Um, and then the resolution came forward to remove SROs. Um, and the vote was uh, just to remove them pretty much immediately. And I wasn't against removing SROs, but it was important to me to also address why what might be the consequences of doing that, um, and also understanding can we still, you know, how important are SROs to school safety, school student and staff safety, what are the other impacts, and how do we understand the role of SROs, and if there are things that they're doing that we need to keep, how do we make sure that those activities still happen in their absence? And so I amended that resolution um, to ask the district to go research that issue and come up with a plan that met both goals. In this case, it was to reduce disproportionate discipline or, and also a sense of, and it's, it's bigger than that. It's not just the discipline issue. It was the, it was the feeling of the relation, the historic relationship between um, police and people of color in our um, community or in the nation, really. But it didn't mean for me that I would do that um, without a process and understanding the issue. So the district came back uh, six or eight months later with a school safety plan. Um, and so what they decided to do was to remove SROs, but add a new team, which are safety, student safety something. I can't remember the ter term. Okay. And they would be um, in all of the high schools and assuming some of the assistance that the teachers needed for discipline, but in a way that was different from the old structure of security resource officers. And that's when I voted to remove SROs. Um, and that's important to me. Um, and I also think it was important for the community. And so there was just an update a month ago with the school board that it's been really successful. And I think it was successful. And, I, and I'm quoting a little bit Rachel Friend to do things so it sticks. So if you're not yeah. aware, Denver did a really quick removal of SROs. And four months later, they put them back because they hadn't thought about all the things that those people were doing and that were needed in their schools and they didn't come up with a strong alternative. 
And so I feel like the way we approach this as a board, and I think, and, and all the board members I think would agree, is in a way that it sticks. And so that's important. And sometimes, yes, it was probably really, really frustrating that I amended the resolution and that it took more or time. Or maybe you were perceived as slowing down the, the process. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's another really good thing is sometimes when we talk about housing or we talk about um, anything. Homelessness, some, yeah. Yeah, homelessness. Some things look like you're slowing the process intentionally to not get there. And one sure. of the most yeah. difficult things is, is Tina slowing the process because she doesn't want to remove SROs? Or is she authentically trying to remove them in a thoughtful way so it sticks? Yeah. I like to obviously think that I'm the latter, yeah. but you'll see that even with housing. Like was saying, when I said I don't want to do increased occupancy because I want to maintain some housing stock for people with children, which still would maybe result in four to five people per home. Mm -hmm. So the net number of humans wouldn't change, whether it was five college students or mm -hmm. two adults and three children. Same number of people. Yeah. Was I trying just to, to, to be against, you know, communal living? Am I anti something or am I authentically looking to create middle housing opportunities for families? Again, it's the latter, but it may be perceived differently. And I think it's always, you know, with any elected leader, are they slowing down something that they just don't ever want? Or are they yeah. slowing it down to create something that they truly value? Um, and I think that's a good thing to, and it's pretty hard to get at, but I think that that's something that we see in leadership. Um, so. Interesting. Um, yeah, there, there's a, a, it seems like, you know, if, if things feel stalled, we blame analysis paralysis. And right. then we talk about how everyone in Boulder has an opinion. Everyone has a PhD in economics or right. a public policy, <laughs> you know, like, um, or, 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 or thinks, thinks they have the equivalent in life experience, you know. And um, yeah, it can, it can be very tricky and heated, right? Like, mm -hmm. like um, I think, you know, I, I got into politics through the Bedrooms Are For People right. initiative, so I campaigned for that. And uh, it was, a, you know, it was a super interesting exercise for me in learning how to, um, how, even how the city works, how different people's point of views uh, work and, um, the, the the angle you just gave about five unrelated adults versus a, a kind of a nuclear family. Um, I, I actually haven't heard anyone frame it that way. Uh, oh. ex, ex, you know, just the way you put it. Um, and uh, the thing that I sort of retort is I think about like, um, you know, west of rest of Broadway, whenever I'm up in these hills and I look down over the city, I'm, I'm kind of always amazed by how much land Mm -hmm. is west of Broadway, because I kind of think of it as in my brain of, of what's possible for me of where I might live. Uh -huh. It's sort of off limits, you know, it's so expensive. And, yeah. um, but, it, but it's a huge amount of land. And I, I picture it as being full of large houses that have one or two people in them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those houses, I can imagine two families living in them, right. you know, or or uh, two families and some some borders, you know, like, you know, if you have a, if you have a 5,000 square foot house, that's, that's room for a lot of people, you right. know, so the, when I think of that area of town, trying to imagine uh, putting five people in there in some way that would be affordable to some demographic mm -hmm. that we're trying to serve doesn't seem all that likely, but you know, I, <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just throw that out as a, as kind of like, what what I heard when you said that. Yeah, no, and it, I think it's just different thoughts. I mean, so, and I yeah. think it's why it was a controversial initiative. So, I mean, bedrooms is, is actually pretty different than the ordinance. Oh, yeah, that's true. And, yeah. I, and I do recognize that. Um, yeah. um, so uh, I had, uh, I interviewed uh, Terry Bernchich recently, and um, uh, I, I think you're a plan endorsed mm -hmm. um, candidate. Yeah, right. So I asked her about ways that she might be open to making her neighborhood uh, more inclusive and more affordable and more uh, populated, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and she seemed really open to upzoning and um, uh, uh, affordable housing in, in her neighborhood. And I'm curious if, if, uh, if this is a posture or attitude that, that you share. Um, yeah, and I I feel like a lot of people have moved there. I don't, I mean, I've been here for 21 years. Mm -hmm. 
And I do feel that there is a lot more openness in general to the idea of duplexes um, and triplexes in single family neighborhoods. Yeah. I think there is a concern just because of the development of townhomes that are selling for a million dollars yeah. is what are we going to get in terms of some kind of affordability? And, yeah. and you know, for me, I, this is totally pie in the sky and I, full disclosure, I am not a developer. I'm not even close to it. I have never, you know, mm-hmm. and so I, but I think about like, well, what if there was a way where the city could help two people turn a home into a duplex? What if they gave them huge incentives, like waiving a permitting fee and waiving, um, you know, so like waiving a lot of requirements mm-hmm. so that you could create and then and have it owner led um, so that maybe there's less markups on the property. I'm not dissing developers, but yeah. is there a way to create a more affordable pathway um, to convert an existing property into a duplex? Interesting. And I think that would be of interest um, I think, you know, taking a big lot and then building a new two small homes or a duplex brand new is going to be still really expensive. Um, yeah, just sure. the, and so you have and, to start off by owning the thing. You yeah, know, exactly. Which is expensive so, there. yeah, and it's and that's like that whole land trust idea, which I have been familiar with, you know, for a long time. But now I'm really starting to understand the value of that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And um mm-hmm. I know that there was this legislation that didn't pass this year down at the Capitol that might have given cities a first right of refusal for certain properties, I think, then to, oh, to create. I, th- I think that's what it was, but I, I apologize if I'm misspeaking. But um, Well, we've talked about community land trusts a lot on the podcast. Um, David Adamson was yes. one of the original uh, co-hosts of the of in season one of the of this is our third year of doing it. And uh Yeah, we should, we should, I need to get David back on the podcast and talk about, remind everybody about the the value and the possibility around putting land trust together as a, as a, as a tool in the toolbox for addressing affordability. Yeah. I I mean, I, I still don't totally understand it, but I've spoken to David many times, Uh you know, and so it's just sort of, again, just being creative. Do you live near him by chance? Yeah, I think so. Yes. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I, one of the daydreams I have is with expanded occupancy, and I haven't read through the the ordinance that's passed. I want to read through it in detail and understand the nitty gritties of it. But the possibility of co buying a large house with mm-hmm. another family or with some other adults right. and figure out how to divide it so that uh, my family could live in one part of it or in the basement or an ADU mm-hmm. in the back, and then a, a co op or or roommates in the in the main house, you know, something along those lines. I'm really interested personally in exploring those kinds of possibilities because um, I really don't want to like spend the next 20 years and all this life force into accumulating a down payment and stretching myself thin and thinking about how to make payments for 30 years. Uh, Like I have other things I want to do with my life besides add that kind of stress and financial precarity to to my situation. So like, I'm really interested in figuring out ways to buy, you know, have market rate affordability that's creative and works for me, you know. But you're still talking about an ownership opportunity. <laughs> uh, in this case, yeah, yeah okay. it's an ownership opportunity. Right, so I mean, Although, it's, yeah. I, I, I have been a renter for a long time and I've actually sort of started coming out as a renter, you know, like identifying mm-hmm. as one, yeah. which, is, which is kind of a funny thing because I've always viewed politics and my future through the lens of it being a future homeowner. Mm-hmm. And um, because that's kind of where we see you know, security as being, Mm -hmm. right? Like if you're a homeowner, then you have that security of knowing you have a place and the prices won't go up or down. Um, I don't know. To me, it seems like 53% of the city shouldn't be perpetually insecure when it comes to renting, right? Like, like I feel like we could, we could structure society in a ways where, where we all feel secure in our space. Yeah. I mean, and just this idea of, you know, one of the articles, I'm sure everyone read it, was about the affordable housing in Vienna, Austria. Yeah. And the part I really liked about it is... The social housing. Yeah, the social housing, yeah. yeah. What I liked about it is that when your income started growing, you weren't kicked out immediately out of your housing option. Mm -hmm. And we have a system that I think sometimes isn't gracious for life's 
ups and downs, you know, you're sort of a medical emergency away from not being able to pay your rent or, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and this idea that it's okay for people to, to live comfortably, but it was, I thought it was a neat concept that seemed to provide people <clears throat> housing security and it didn't, I think sometimes there's a concern that people are taking advantage of the system or don't deserve it or, you know, and, and I don't think any of the people in that example were becoming millionaires through living in social housing. Like, I, I don't think that was the case. So, Well, um, what's, a, what's, a, what's a subject that uh, you want people to know more about you um, uh, as they consider voting for you? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll talk a little bit about community engagement. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell us about community. Right. What's your philosophy around community engagement? Yeah. I, I, and I think people talk about community engagement a lot and they talked about it a lot on school board. And so there are lots of ways that, you know, we, I, I think there's really broad recognition that we need to be listening to voices that don't get heard from mm -hmm. a lot. Um, people who don't feel empowered to speak and coming up with systems to do that. Um, while also understanding that at the end of the day, your governing board is going to make a vote. And this is this balance that's, that can be really hard, especially if you find out that you don't support whatever this small group is. I mean, that can be really difficult. But one of the things, I'll just share this story. I, um, I play Mahjong and I was playing Mahjong with some friends and we were upset. Uh, I have a, you know, we have teenagers. And so, you know, we, we weren't loving that they were going on these cruiser rides and, and seemingly getting into a lot of trouble. And so we started talking, we said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we put up a bunch of volleyball nets? Cause I, I noticed that this party, the kids really like volleyball and, and got a DJ at North Boulder Park and let the kids have the park, but it'd be a little more controlled. Mm -hmm. And one of the moms says, yeah, I mean, this is really great. We have four 50 year old women who are sitting here coming up with what the teens want to do on a Saturday night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was a really good reminder of, yeah, a bunch of Here's 50 year old Here's some party hats, kids. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll have pizza and we'll have a gluten-free option. It's going to be, they're going to love us, right? Yeah. So yeah. said no 17 year old ever. Yeah. And so that was just, a, that's a different way of saying like why it's so important to ask people what are they looking for in a meaningful way, meeting them where they are, whether it's linguistic, whether it's geographic, and, and then making sure that that gets back in a way, ideally, like I, I like storytelling, but sometimes it's anecdotal to also try and get um, engagement that's meaningful from a, just a sheer numbers. So it's easy to tell one compelling story, but you need to be careful about whether that's really representative. Yeah. of a population. I'm yeah. very um, attuned to that. Um, I was in a meeting recently where the results of a Be Heard Boulder survey were, uh, were was part of the narrative. And it's like, you cannot say enough that it's not a, it's not a statistically valid survey. It's like, you can't repeat that basic uh, premise of what, what the value a Be Heard Boulder survey gives. Because people just see the numbers and they're like, oh, people think this or people yeah. think that, you know, and it's so it's a really tricky. Uh, yeah. And, and be heard is really tricky because it's a really good idea. Yeah. Because it, it's engagement from your home. Yeah. And I remember going to meetings where they would, you know, put out the site plans for Alpine Balsam or I just went to the airport uh, open house, whatever mm -hmm. that was. And that's hard for people to do, you know. Honestly, at the airport, you couldn't take public transportation to that particular area and parking was really hard. And, you know, so that it was a great it was a great presentation, though. It was a good it was a good event, I thought. But that is hard for people to do. So I appreciate sort of this different. You mean the actual the actual event was hard to get. To, yeah. 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 It was, I mean, it was yeah. way out east by the. Um, yeah. You know, um, the, where they uh, parked the buses for the school district. Right. And so this idea that we go out to different communities and. And all that is great, but I do think we just need to be careful. And um, yeah, there's there's an issue around. Um, you know, we were talking about process before, and how uh, careful process can feel like you know um, stalling mm -hmm. or or just you know a perpetual um, punting. And um, uh, there's a there's a kind of a, a, an adjacent theme that I, I was um, I interviewed Dan Williams uh, yesterday mm -hmm. about. Um, homeless services coordination. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, 
one of the, one of the themes that came up with that is that like um, we have a lot of experts in the city that really have understanding of how solutions can work, mm -hmm. and so to kind of pivot from taking their expertise to like going to like full on community engagement. How do you feel about home? You know, how do you feel? And it's like the, these. I'm not saying these voices don't matter, but like. We're not all experts in how to solve this very complicated problem. We actually have a bunch of experts who mm -hmm. know how to solve this complicated problem. And so like to give them more voice or give them, you know, like it's a very tricky balance, I believe. Uh, to yeah, I think there's a parallel, I feel a little bit sometimes with climate, actually, mm -hmm. um, because I <clears throat> all the candidates got to meet with the city staff, which was great. And I and I actually my one piece of feedback would be I wish they could have the experience we had offered before you declared your candidacy so that you had a deeper understanding of what's already being worked on effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and also that, um, you know, the school district now has this leadership institute that invites community members to get a lot deeper understanding of what the different departments are doing, what the goals are, what the strategies are to reach those goals and how they're measuring it. And I, um, I would love for the city to think about doing that too. I think it would help the overall perception of inactivity or disinterest quite a bit. Um, it would be, I, I think it'd be valuable, but um, with climate, they, they are a, a team that has funding that I think is doing really good work. And um, I would trust. I'm sorry, who is the team? The Climate Initiatives team. Okay. okay. Yeah. And th through the city? Yes. Or, yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, they seem like they're doing a great job and being really. Is that like an advisory board or a commission? No, no, or? these are employees. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. it's a department. All right. And so they're working on flood and fire. Okay, great. So, and yeah. it, it seems like, like you know, they're, they're talking about the things that we're talking anecdotally about. Yeah. Like, is juniper trees the big problem? Like they made a joke about that. It was kind of funny, but wooden fencing. I mean, they are talking about it and uh, it was really great to hear. So you're right, there are experts. I do think it gets trickier and this is truly really true in education. You know, we've seen experts also be trendy. So, <laughs> totally. so in education, yeah. I have to admit, I yeah. come, yes, there are experts, but there are experts who definitely say different things. And yeah. so that is where you make the hard choices and why you should, you know, when you're looking at your elected leaders, well, which expert are they going to listen to? Because it's not, you know, there's not always consensus around issues, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and, and we really saw that during the pandemic, too. And when people say that they're data people, I, I appreciate that. And I want to be data driven. And I also want to be and lots of conversations with lots of other people who have tried different, you know, other cities and regions right. and be, you know, reading about what works and what doesn't. But something that, you know, kind of gets under my skin is when you say we're going to be scientific about this, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like city politics is messy and it's yes. not science. It's like it's more like medicine. You know, it's like right. it's it's a practice. It's an art. And it's also science mm -hmm. in, to some extent. But it's not really like you know, plug in the numbers and here comes out the, here comes out what you need for right. policy. So, so, yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah. and so I, you know, you can find a research or a data set, I think for anything at this point. Yeah. And yeah. the internet's made it even richer. Mm -hmm. So. Well, thank you for spending time with me today yeah. on this podcast. Uh, I do want to give you one more opportunity for a, a parting shot or uh, anything else that you might want to say that, that you haven't come around to. Yeah, no, I'll just close by thanking you for, you know, inviting me to speak. And um, I really am committed to Boulder having lived here for 21 years and trying to balance, you know, the needs, like what we love about Boulder, why I moved here. Mm -hmm. Um, we feel like it's, it's frustrating to try to solve the problems that our community is facing around climate, housing, homelessness. Um, and I'm hoping that what I'm hearing on this campaign from a lot of different people are the same things on both sides. What I'm hearing is that people really, really care about people who are suffering right now. Mm -hmm whether you're a progressive with a capital P or whether you're on Plan Boulder, I don't see the level of caring to be any different. Yeah. There is so much compassion. And mm -hmm. I feel that people want, 
people who work here to be able to live here. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge is how, and I'm not sure it's a one size fits all. I think we're going to have to look at a lot of different things. But what I'm finding is that it's our commonality and it's so pithy, but it probably will be our strength. And I think that we have spent an extraordinary amount of time pushing each other apart who basically have the same values and the same love of people and humanity. And I do, you know, this is getting a little Aaron Nyer, but <laughs> no, Aaron... I, I love Aaron. <laughs> Aaron yeah. said the most beautiful thing at the Plan Boulder Forum. I mean, he is an inspiration, just the way he said, gosh, we all care so much. So why are we getting so up in each other's, you know, business? And why are we being so polarized? And, yeah. and one of my answers to the polarized, I said, because... All the media groups or the all the groups keep asking yes or no questions. And as mm -hmm. long as we ask yes and no questions, it's as if we are working hard and fast to polarize. And if we decide there is no nuance and there is no complexity, then we are feeding into that polarization every time we do that. So um, so I hope we move away from that. I know we love our scorecards. Everyone's making one right now. And I really admire all the people who are engaged. But when we do that, we also end conversations. And I don't think that's going to help our community move forward. Yeah, I've heard people say that talk is cheap. And I always push back. I, I say it's the most precious thing we have. And, and uh, we need a lot more of it. So yeah. um, I, I know what they mean. But, you know, like being in dialogue is there's there's no substitute for it. Yeah. So that's that's part of the goal of the podcast is right. to. Um, give you a chance to, you know, speak with nuance and, and, and uh, more than just the, the, the clips. So really appreciate you taking time and being part of this. Yeah, thank you. Gonna find me a residential pedestrian district where I can gracefully grow older. Gonna spend my remaining years sharing both. Thank you for listening to Sharing Boulder. Please support the podcast by sharing it with your friends and neighbors. You can contact me at linktree slash philipogren, which you can find by visiting sharingboulder.us, where you can also find show notes and previous episodes. This episode of Sharing Boulder was produced by Philip Ogren and edited by Katie Avery. The music was created by Nathaniel Ogren and Sack Lunch. Keep sharing, Boulder.